They make it obvious that you're being recorded. We want you to, to know that too. Good morning and thank you. Welcome, for, uh, welcome to this webinar, um, an ongoing series of webinars that Pens has been hosting uh, all year to help you get ready for your fundraising campaigns, your pledge campaigns, promise campaigns, stewardship campaigns. They go by many names in our church. Uh, and I want you to be successful this year in your fundraising. So we are uh, providing these to help you get ready. Today's uh, webinar is gonna drill down into the materials that you might use uh, to make your case and support your work. So we're talking about brochures and narrative budgets and website forms and your web pages and your social media channels, uh, things that you might use to broadcast your message and talk to you. If you would uh, be so kind as to put yourselves on mute now, go ahead and take a second to do that. Then I'll make sure that um, we don't hear background noise as we are like that. Um, as we're going through today's webinar. Uh, so um, put yourself on mute and uh, come off mute when you've got a question and that's during Q&A time, please. All right, we're gonna get started. Thank you again for being here this morning. Today, I hope that uh, our learning objectives will be talking about why we even need a case for support. You might think that uh, your members showing up week after week uh, and being a part of your community for any length of time might already know why you raise money and what your mission and ministries are, but uh, they might not. They might not know how to articulate it. So we're gonna help you today create the kinds of materials that can, um, that can cause impact and help people understand just why they're raising money. We're gonna talk about briefly talk about generational differences in donor engagement. And we'll go over uh, our different generations and how they perceive information, how they're inclined to participate and engage as donors and give you a few little metrics to help you with that. We'll talk finally about how you craft your case statement, what the art and design look like so that you can put your case statement together. Why do we have a case for support? Why do we need a case for support in our uh, congregational fundraising? Your case for support tells your story. This is first and foremost what you want to accomplish. You want people to feel that they know your, your congregation well, the charism, the characteristics, the openness, and, and the ministries that you support and that you are engaged in. We want people to know that and every congregation has a story to tell. We want to help connect your members to your mission and vision. You might think again that everybody knows this, right? They go to church, they should understand what the mission of church is, but your church has a particular ministry or ministries in your communities that you support, inward and outward. And we want people to be able to articulate that. We want them to know why their church do, is doing the work that you're doing so that they can better know how to support it and how to tell others about it. Most importantly, how to tell others about it. We want to help you build commitment to your goals. This is what a case for support will do. The first thing you need is a plan and uh, your strategic plan uh, which may have been created uh, by a consulting firm or by your vestry or by your congregation at a retreat. It might have been gathering dust for a while, uh, sitting on a shelf or in a presentation room somewhere on some chart pads. Uh, it's time to take a look at that. And it's time to take a look at your strategic plan and say, is it still who we are? Is it still matching up with the people that are here today, with the work that we want to accomplish? with the neighborhood in which we are embedded, uh, take a look at your strategic plan. If you don't have one, um, don't be alarmed. You can start by uh, stating the goals of your ministry. 
who are you serving? And we're gonna ask some questions later on today to help you understand how to engage with your community and pay attention to the work that needs to be done and the ways that you and your community can engage that work. Speaking of work, um, what are the measurable impacts that your ministries have in your community? Measuring impact, uh, and I will start this conversation and we'll have it as this webinar uh, continues today, measuring your impact is something really important for our congregations to do. It's, it's great to say that you serve meals. It's better to say how many people are served in your food ministry. What are they eating? How, is that, uh, how does that food get purchased or donated? Tell the story of it. And what impact does it have? What, what do the people who receive food from your food ministry, for example, go out and do? They uh, don't have to spend as much as their, of their disposable income on groceries. They're able to give nutritious meals to their kids. Uh, what are the stories, the impacts that your uh, ministry has? Inward as well. How many people are taking advantage of your uh, pastoral care? Uh, are you engaging small groups or education programs or just reaching out and staying in touch with each other? These also have measurable impacts, and we'll talk about those even more today as we go through this webinar. And finally, you should be a little aspirational in your uh, case for support. Your case for support describes what you're currently doing and how you're doing it, but it should also provide some hope for the future, some plans for the future. Right now we're doing this and we hope to do this, or next year with your gifts, we'll be able to do this or that. Being a little aspirational helps people um, increase their giving or be more dedicated to the gifts that they give, helps you be able to explain the need and the urgency behind your appeal for their, uh, their funds this year. What makes impact is one of the things that is really important in how we tell the story of our church and our ministry in the community. Your case should remind members of why their gifts are important by reminding them what impact they have. We're gonna talk later, as I said, about generational differences. And this really comes into play with some of your younger members. They really want to see impact uh, and they wanna see where the money is going, where the volunteer hours are being spent, what you're doing in the community to change the world. Your case should motivate people, your members to think generously. This goes back to being a little aspirational. So ask people to dig deep and then give them a reason for why they need to dig deep. That's not just deep into their pockets or into their bank account, but deep into their heart and deep into their theology. Please understand what we're doing, how we're changing the world, how we are enacting God's call to us to be here in the world, to go out into the community and to change the world for the better. Your case then becomes the template for your talking points of your pledge campaign and your website, your social media channels, things like that. Why do I say that talking points are important? It's because what I hope that a good case, a well-reasoned rational case statement will do is give your members the language and the metrics they need to be able to talk about what your church does to other people, other members, so have those conversations internally and externally. We want people to be proud of the work that their church does in the, in the community. Be proud of the ways that the church takes care of each other inside and to be able to articulate that in some talking points. In church, we tell stories and sometimes they go really long, right? And we have a model for that in, in, in the gospel, we have long parables sometimes that describe really precise points that Jesus wants to make for us. And we've adopted that style of long storytelling and it's beautiful. We should talk long stories every once in a while. 
But we also should take some models and methods from our nonprofit friends and neighbors who are helping us craft talking points so that we then can articulate the essentials, the basics, the key points of what our ministry does and how we can broadcast that to the world. We're doing great work. It's good news. Let's learn how to share it for all the different channels that are out there. When you are creating your case statement, and we'll go at the end of today's webinar, we'll go more into depth on how the art and the craft of your case comes together. But I want to make this point now, and I'll make it again as we go forward today. You should draft your case for support and test it before it's ready to go. You should test it on a small sample, uh, not just your vestry, but members of your community and pick people intentionally that satisfy different criteria or different characteristics of your community. So have some generational diversity, have some diversity in how long they've been members uh, and try to uh, cover uh, gender and ethnic identities as well so that you understand how your case hits individuals uh, differently. This, can, this feedback process is really helpful as you create your case statement and help people understand how your church needs to broadcast its message. Yeah, it takes an extra couple of weeks in, in the timeline as you are crafting your case statement and getting ready to roll it out for your campaign, but the refinement that can come from testing your case against real members, how do you respond to this? What does it, what do you feel about it? How does it, uh, how does it sit with you? Does it motivate you? Is it too much information? Uh, will help you then create the best possible case that you can. Again, this is about helping your members identify and motivate and be ready to give. So don't forget this testing piece. Yeah, it adds some timeline or adds some time to your timeline, but build it in because it's really important to refine it. You might find that you have multiple communities within your community uh, or different kinds of messaging that you want to pull out or tease out of your case statement. And so I don't think we need to go and prepare a whole bunch of different documents, a brochure for, brochure for this and a brochure for that. Um, but we might need to create different talking points based on the people or communities that we're talking to. For example, do newcomers need to hear information differently than your longtime members? And what might you say about your case for support to someone who's been coming only for a few months versus someone who's been coming there for decades. How do you talk about that? And how do you talk about your process for fundraising with newcomers? We ask for pledges. We do this once a year. It's the way that we run it. It's how we build our budget. What sorts of information do newcomers need to know about how you raise and spend your money? Maybe they need to look at your budget. Maybe they need to see where the money's going. Uh, so you should definitely test your case on newcomers and ask them, what is it that would be most helpful for you to know and get better acquainted with who we are and why we ask for your gifts every year? Uh, we need to know why different generations are motivated and how they're motivated. So this is to say, your, um, your mature folks and your Gen X folks and your Gen Z folks, they all process information differently and they all have different motivations for giving. How can you tease out points of your case that appeal to them and help them understand how they can be a part of it? Many of our congregations uh, apply for outside funding from community granting agencies or local businesses that offer uh, community support grants and things like that. Uh, and we often have to craft those 
grant requests really quickly because somebody brings us an opportunity and they need the letter tomorrow and it all has to go out, right? With, and, and, and it's not just big foundations and grant making institutions that this applies to. Almost all of your uh, retail, um, your big retail stores in your communities have some sort of community granting process and they might give your, your ministry, you know, 500 or a thousand or 1500 bucks, maybe not a whole lot of money, comparatively speaking, but little bits add up over time. Uh, you should find out how to make the case for them. And that is how many people go here? Who are they? What do they care about? Give them some information that says, ah, if we give some money to support this, uh, these people will look favorably on us and they're people we want to do business with, right? So there's a little reciprocity there when we're talking about grant funding and community support information. So you don't need to redo your case statement. We need to be able to pull things out of it and present it to folks who are asking you for details about money. Um, I talk a lot in this, uh, I just want to say this uh, so that so it can be said. I talk a lot about fundraising in this webinar, probably more than, uh, than other webinars that TENS does. I don't want us to lose track of the fact that we are also asking for people's time and talent, for them to share their volunteerism, their wisdom, their great experience in life with us. And this webinar is very much focused on, our, on the financial parts of our fundraising campaign. So uh, if you're hearing over and over me talking about funding, there's a purpose for it in this webinar. But don't get, don't get lost in that and know that we're also asking for volunteers and we're also asking for wisdom and committee participation and all the other things that go into our pledge campaigns. Let's talk a little bit about these generational differences um, and how they impact donor motivation. And after we get through this section, I'm gonna pull up and ask us for Q&A on everything we've talked about. So if you've got questions, you've got a chance to ask them in a minute or so. Different generations think about funding and, uh, and giving differently. This is true. And it's important for us not to ignore it in our congregations because uh, how we ask for money and how we present to the need for fundraising in our communities is really important to different generations. We are at a time in, in society that we've never experienced as a human race before, where we have more generations alive and active at one time than we've ever had because of the miracles of modern science and medicine and long lifespans. And because uh, our youth start getting involved early in things and start to make decisions earlier than perhaps in other generations or, or start to engage in the donor process earlier than they might have in other generations. We have five generations right now that are active donors in your congregations. That's five slightly different approaches to how they are motivated to give and how they like to receive information. So nonprofits have been spending a lot of time uh, looking at this issue because they're really good at drilling down and asking different demographics for money in different ways. And so our churches can learn some lessons from this too. So let's talk about our mature folks. Um, these are folks who were born uh, 1945 and earlier, and they are, um, they are very much a part of the giving strategy and funding strategy in our congregations. Your congregation likely has many folks in this category who are making some of the most generous and have made for several decades the most generous gifts in your congregation's pledge campaigns. As a whole, this generation is churched. They go to church, they give money to church, 
and they volunteer in church. So uh, as a whole, this generation knows and feels church in a different way than some of our younger generations might. It's more a part of the daily life, social fabric of, of people. Folks who fall into this category generally, so this, these are general statements, not individual ones, but they're general statements. They support institution. So this is to say the church has been there for them. They want the church to be there for the next ground, the next generations, and they trust the institution. They've been brought up to trust institution. They understand institution. They're wise to the ways of institutions and the way they've gotten derailed or changed. This talks about government, uh, social structures, corporations, and churches. Uh, so it's not like they have a, that they have rose colored glasses about institutions, but they certainly understand and trust them. Uh, they are care, they care much about the pastoral care that are involved in churches. So that community aspect, seeing their friends, the church being there for them, visiting each other. This generation is very much about face-to-face -face contact. And that's important in how we ask for money. Uh, they want the church to be there for future generations. And so this generation, if they have not yet made a planned gift to your congregation, this is the group that you should be absolutely asking to make a planned gift and spend time with them to understand uh, planned giving, create that legacy society in your congregation. Sure. This is something I got from JP. So I'll take the rest of those things back. Or reinvigorate it. Uh, I don't want the pants or the shirt. Well, I was going to show them to you, see. So I'm oh, going to show you. There we go. I muted everyone just for a minute there. If you'd like to speak later, please just unmute yourself. Um, so this is the generation that really needs to um, be making planned gifts if they haven't. We'll talk more in depth about planned giving at, at another time. Uh, this group funds capital gifts, uh, often out of retirement, get, uh, retirement accounts. They have and understand the need for capital giving. And these folks also make very generous annual gifts. Although we must now understand that they are living on retirement accounts. Uh, They're no longer in their earning years, most likely. And so uh, their annual gifts might be structured in a different way. This is important to note. Uh, they might start to be tapering off. Our baby boomers, let's talk about them for a little bit. These are folks born 1946 to 64. They are also pretty heavily interested in church, um, although not quite as much as their parents and grandparents' generation. So 48% as a whole donate to the church uh, and 49% volunteer with their church. This, con this group uh, does trust institution, but it's verify, trust and verify, right? So they want to know a little bit about the finances. They might wanna see the budget, ask questions about how the money is spent. This generation has come through uh, things like Watergate and other scandals. And so they really want to understand how things can go wrong and maybe take a, a deeper look, uh, but they are willing to trust an institution that they trust. And this is really important in how they make decisions about giving. They do want the church to be there for them and for future generations. And so again, this is, this, these are the folks who also should be in line to make planned gifts and legacy gifts for your congregation. Please be asking them for them. Please reinvigorate your legacy societies if, you, if they've fallen dormant in 2020 and in 2021. Uh, it's time to give them a little lift and make sure that these folks are know about the kinds of gifts that they can make that reduce their tax burden, reduce tax burden on their, um, on their children, and also um, will make generous gifts to the church. There's so much to do. Of course, these folks are also making generous annual gifts and capital gifts. So they are a broad spectrum of giving in your congregation. 
this is the wealthiest generation ever to have lived since we've been keeping these sorts of statistics. And in the next uh, few decades, in the next decade, really, this generation will, um, will release $30 trillion to the next generation and, and to the institutions that uh, have been created and that they've supported through their gifts. $30 trillion is a lot of money that's about to be uh, shifted from one generation to another. Now it's gonna look a little different uh, than it did in previous generations where wealth came directly from parents to children and stayed mostly in the family. Uh, baby boomers have a wider variety and an array of charities that they trust. Their church is one of them, their arts organizations, uh, social justice and environmental organizations, uh, their schools, they're making generous gifts across a wide variety. And so not all of that money is going to go directly to the next generation. It's going to go um, to a wide variety of gifts. So I want your church to be in line to receive those gifts. Please make certain that you are talking with folks now about their plans for giving. Let's talk about my generation, the so-called lost generation of Gen X. These are folks from 1965 to 1976. Uh, lower church donation. Look at this statistic, it's very interesting. So 38% universally donate to church and 60% volunteer. So what does that say? That says that the social justice ministries, the kinds of programs, reading programs, food programs, um, tutoring, after school tutoring, things like that are important uh, and people will volunteer with them as a community organization, but they might not come back on Sunday and go to church. They might not give money to the church because they see it as a service. A good case for support will help this, these casual volunteers in your church who are operating your programs who may not be participants in your regular church to understand that those ministries in which they volunteer need money and they can become donors to your church as well. Let's not forget the people who volunteer with us who might not be members. And a lot of them are Gen X and millennials. Um, this, this generation has seen all kinds of scandal in institutions, government scandal, They've seen, uh, we saw CEOs shackled in WorldCom and Enron, and we've seen, um, we've seen hedge funds uh, come and go, and we've seen those sorts of headlines. And so there's a great skepticism about institution and institutional giving. So there's a test, testing phase that Gen X folks go through, and that's volunteering first, maybe sitting on the periphery of a community before getting involved. They wanna know, do these people really mean it? Do they really do the work that they're going to do? What matters to them? Uh, this group may not be ready to think about their own mortality yet and start to be thinking about planned gifts, although some of them will, but this is where a lot of your annual and capital giving will come from. This generation is in its prime earning years um, and uh, many of them have seen their uh, children already go to college. This is, they're just becoming empty nesters. They're still making their best salaries. These are the folks um, who will make your very generous annual gifts if you ask them the right way and give them a good reason to do it. And again, this generation is gonna get a whole lot of money from its parents and grandparents. The millennials, uh, perhaps our um, most misunderstood generation. Uh, so we have two generations, the boomers and the millennials that are very large, Gen X kind of sandwiched in between them, a small generation uh, population wise. Millennials, there are a whole lot of them. And um, some of them donate to church, it's a pretty low amount uh, universally. Uh, and a little bit more volunteer. Again, they want to see the social justice 
How is the church changing lives? Then maybe they'll be a part of it. Um, let's look at the fact that this generation is very generous. They may not be making gifts to church because they haven't seen church as the place that is doing work to change the world yet because they haven't been told about all the good things that you're doing in your community and for your community. But 89% of this generation donates to nonprofits. That's a huge percentage. So this is to say our nonprofit neighbors are really good at asking millennials for gifts and the millennials are saying yes to that. They are even less trusting of institutions. So they really look at places that are grassroots, that are small, that are community embedded. This is where your church can really talk about how you are involved in a neighborhood, serving local needs uh, and helping your own neighborhood be vibrant and thriving. This generation cares a lot about small, large impact in small places, uh, generally. These are all general statements. Um, this generation really wants to know what the church is doing in the community and why it matters. Then they will become supporters and donors. They're likely to start first as volunteers. So when you see those millennial volunteers show up at your food pantry or your clothing drive or your cleanup uh, work or as tutors for your after school program, take them in, show them what you're doing, help them feel engaged. And maybe they'll begin to donate. Maybe they will even uh, become members. They're open to having their hearts changed, this generation is. Finally, we'll talk about our youngest generation, our Gen Z folks. Uh, they're born in after 1996. So look at this first statistic together. By 20 years old, 30% of this generation have already made a donation to a nonprofit. Now we know social media uh, makes it easy. On Facebook, you can ask for money for your birthday or whatever and donate it to a cause. Uh, Kickstarter and other kinds of uh, buzzy, um, catchy, viral uh, fundraising campaigns are high in this generation, uh, <clears throat> but they are saying yes to it. At 20 years old, I was not making donations to nonprofits. Uh, so this generation is already doing that. Let's celebrate that and give them a great reason and a great place to come and make some good gifts. So the first statistic there is really interesting. The second, even more so. So 97% of this generation has made an online gift for a charitable purpose. This is incredible. This says to me that your church better have a way to accept money online because your Gen Z folks don't carry cash and they will make a gift online. Now they might not have a lot of money to give, but as we've seen in the most recent um, political campaigns, uh, a lot can be raised on five and $10 gifts asked frequently, right? And those recurring gifts that online giving platforms can generate when you toggle that recurring gift, $5 a month is $60 a year. And that starts to add up, right? For, for communities and for congregations to think about. So really get your online fundraising in gear if you want this generation to participate and they will respond because they are generous and because they give money to good purposes, but they wanna see something for it. They wanna see action and impact from the work that they're supporting. They wanna see what you are doing and they wanna understand how it fits in with changing the world. This generation wants to see the world change. They are deeply dissatisfied with how the planet has been treated, how certain populations in our community and the world have been treated, uh, how we treat each other. They want to see social change. This generation 
wants the church. If they're if the church wants its money, they want the church to be a part of that change. And so this is really important when you talk about your outward facing ministries and the kinds of programs that you do, you'll appeal to this generation. They are not likely to pledge, but they will give when asked. This is important because the model in our Episcopal churches is so focused on a pledge campaign and filling out that paperwork and being in that cycle. And that works for so many of us. But this generation, they might be changing addresses frequently. They might be supporting something in a city that they no longer live in because they have a connection to it, right? And so this generation is very mobile. They're very online. Um, and they might not make a pledge, but when you ask them through your email campaign, through your social media channels, they might give you money. So think about that. Not every member who gives money to your church needs to be a pledging member. Some people will give, and I think we're going to see more and more of it as these generations really come into their own, these younger generations really come into their own giving. They're going to um, they're going to respond less to pledge and more to gifts and be spontaneous. And so we, the church, are going to have to change our approach. We're going to have to start asking for money more frequently. We're going to have to start asking for money in different ways if we want to keep up with these other generations um, and continue the work of the church. Some last uh, notes on appealing to the youngest three generations that we have, our late Gen X, our millennials, and our Gen Z. Again, show results. Uh, Gen Xers are motivated, Gen Xers and millennials and Gen Zs are motivated to give, um, are not motivated to give because they want to maintain the status quo, right? So. They don't want to see the same thing done, the same approaches. They want to see innovation. This group responds to things like disruption in the marketplace, right? This is why startups and online things are so important to this generation, because they like to see how it kind of comes in and breaks the system and changes things for the better. They want to see results. They want to know how they're giving which is sacrificial at this level. They're young. They're not necessarily well established yet. They're making um, their beginning salaries. And so a gift from this generation is a really important gift. It's a sacrifice. And so they want to know that they are doing something uh, that is making a difference. You should really focus on retaining this group. So give them the information about Generosity as a discipline, generosity as a practice. This group is very in touch with its uh, inner self. Uh, and as much as we like to say, no, they're just on devices and they only play video games, um, there's some introspection that happens in this group as well. We want to give them some understanding about how generosity can become a practice, a relaxation technique, Right? They, they want to see these kinds of things that help them feel more expansive when so much of their world is about texting and being inward, right? Give them a reason to open up their chest and arms and breathe deeply. Uh, these are things theologically, spiritually that the church can provide them. Encourage volunteerism. These groups, these younger generations want to test the waters before they become donors before they become members of your church. They want to see what you're doing. They want to see how you are in the community. So give them volunteer opportunities. Invite them in. Uh, you'll be surprised when you make an open call for volunteers in, in your community who responds to that if you're doing work that is important and that they can see manifest. And please don't forget discipleship. Ultimately, we want our, our donors um, especially these younger donors, to feel the call of the church, to feel included and welcomed. This group sees things differently, sees themselves differently than other generations. They're more fluid in their identity and open to ideas. And so the more the church can encourage 
them to be who they are, express themselves, and find their home in a church, the more we will bring this generation closer into us and help them become members who become supporters, who become sustainers of our communities and in the work with us. Before we move into really how do we craft a case statement and what does it look like, I've given you a lot of information about demographics and overall, and I wonder if you've got some questions. So I'm going to bring us into our, um, into our community. If you have questions, uh, please type them into the chat or use your reaction button and raise your hand. Uh, and then I will and come off mute and I'll call on you and I'd love to hear what you have to say. Any questions about um, what we've covered so far? Generational differences, why you need a case for support? Let's hear what you got. Phoebe, I see that you have your hand up. You want to come off mute? Yeah. Here you go. How's that? We can hear you. So we've had the question. You can? Okay. We've had the question with our stewardship committee. Uh, if working and asking for special funds, uh, does that draw down money from what you're hoping to get from pledge and pledges? Um, and is it a whole different concept? I can see there's a lot of education we have to do here. So we haven't done, we did one special fund this year at St. Luke's um, for security system and raised over $20,000 with a GoFundMe. So, ooh, that was a surprise. Amazing. Um, but did those, did those people then not pledge what they were gonna pledge? Well, so that's a question. I think you might want to pay attention in this year's stewardship campaign to see how they perform. Did they, it, did they already make their gift and they feel that they're done? Um, I've seen evidence shows that, um, that the giving for a special fund comes from a special place and that annual giving or pledge giving comes from people's sort of routine. And so if you are doing both of those asks and being really specific, for example, you raised this money you said through a GoFundMe, which is different from your pledge campaign or your church fundraising. And so people will see them as different things. This is really important because um, it helps folks uh, think about two pockets, right? This is my annual gift to the church. It needs to happen to sustain our ongoing ministries. And then from time to time, the church needs a special fundraising effort for a security system or for a small upgrade that may not rise to the level of full-on capital campaign uh, or special ministries as in we're collecting money for relief for this or for you know our sisters and brothers in a hurricane uh, region or an earthquake zone or whatever those don't usually impact our annual giving if they are done in really obviously separate ways so congratulations and good thinking to raise that special money through a GoFundMe because um, it's different from your annual giving and people will think of it differently. Right. Good job, Phoebe. And, and David, how about um, capital campaign, which we, that's sort of tricky, you know, when did the capital campaign impact the pledging and yowie? We, we, we have a lot of thinking to do, which we're doing, so. Yeah. You're, you're right on that too, Phoebe. And also, you know, evidence shows us over and over again that if you have a well-crafted case for your operating support and a well-crafted case for your capital campaign, that people can make that, they can make that leap. They can give a sacrificial short-term capital gift and continue their annual giving, especially when you say this capital gift should be made from gifts that you can afford to make outside of your annual giving. We don't want you to uh -huh. sacrifice your annual giving uh -huh. for a capital campaign. 
uh, because you're, then you're, you know, you're robbing your, your budget uh, for something else. So you have to be really clear about it. I've seen some really great campaigns that do a, a stewardship pledge and a capital pledge in the same conversation. So the person who asks for their annual gift will then say, I'm also here to talk to you about the capital campaign and lay out the strategy when you're doing that kind of a campaign, that face-to-face -face, uh, campaign work that happens so often in capital campaigns. And they're beautiful gifts because then people understand, well, the church budget still needs to operate and the church still has to do its work and it needs upgrades on the roof and whatever. So just be very clear about the uses uh, and one won't rob the other. Thanks Thank for you. your question. Thank you. Great questions. Uh, Carol, you've got your hand up. Yes, I do. Um, I uh, am noticing that most of the people that I can at least see on the screen are uh, reflective of the church I go to, uh, gray. And we have an older generation church and um, one of the issues I have found in the past is that the Gen X and Gen Z, once they go off to college, they leave and they don't come back. Um, even if they come back to the city and their parents are still going, we can, we don't, they, they somehow have separated themselves from church. And do you have any suggestions for some way of encouraging them to come back? Um, great question and reflects reality, right? Uh, so we do see in the younger generations that shift toward no religious affiliation. Um, and we also have evidence that says when they start having kids that some number of them might come back, um, but some number of them aren't coming back. We know this, right? We see it happening around us. Um, I can't and don't have time to address all of that. And I don't think we all have time to yeah, I don't address do that. the depth of that. But here's some things that I can say. What we know about these generations is that they do care about the work being done and that our churches do work. They do work in the community. They support the community. They are really, uh, you know, so this is important for our congregations to do. The other thing churches don't do well is share the news of how they impact the community, right? We might tell our own members, but we don't tell the greater world what we do for the community. We hide this light and it's brilliant, bright light. So I like to remind people that your local community paper that's mostly full of advertisements and coupons, um, they're also desperate for content. And if you give them a picture and an article, they will run it in that free newspaper that hits the zip codes around your church. And you can use that as a great tool to share information about what's happening at your church, people you're feeding, students you're mentoring, uh, parks that you're cleaning up, um, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, all the things that you're doing, you can present those facts. Now, people might not read um, paper newspapers that come for free in their mailbox, but they also all have online versions and uh, social media channels. Use your next door uh, post to do something besides complain about recycling, which is mostly what next door is about, but use it for, um, you know, talking about the work your church is doing. These things advertise to younger generations that your church is active. And again, as we said, um, as we're learning, um, younger generations want to test the water a little. So it's, it's their parents' church or their grandparents' church. If you're asking them to come back, why are you asking them to come back? It's not just for catechism and for communion. Uh, it is also for the work. And we want them to understand that the work is the greater thing that we're doing. And that's what will hook them if, they're, if they need a hook, right? If they're not just coming back uh, of their own volition. 
Great Thank question, you. Carol. Thank you for it. Hi, Jerry. Come off mute and ask your question. Okay, uh, this is more of a comment than a question. Uh, I think most generations can and do respond to online communications. So you don't want to keep that to just the uh, younger people. Absolutely. And also another comment in, uh, in some churches that I see and been involved with, uh, as far as college is concerned, the longer you have them uh, in your church, you can still communicate with them in college. Even if they leave, they'll remember what, what, what they've done. They'll give or come back or your, um, your, your college ministry can help there too. Yep. Um, this is a great reminder to support the college chaplaincies at all the places that your graduating seniors are going off to. Send them a $50 check, send them a little um, nudge. You know, hey, pay attention to Susie. She's coming on your campus this fall. Uh, take a look out for her. We've, we've raised her and, and she's ready to enter your care now. Um, the other thing that I've seen congregations do to stay in touch with their graduating seniors and moving off to college is to remember them, <laughs> send them a care package at exam time, right? It costs a few bucks to put together a box of, of snacks and, um, you know, so warm socks or whatever kids need, to, you know, hot chocolate mix so that they can have something comforting in their dorm, um, a little book money, you know, congregations that do this, give them an Amazon card so they can buy books and maybe send them some snacks at, at exam time. Um, keep those people in their hearts uh, and keep them in their thoughts. And this is really important. If we, we have to do the work to keep in touch with our college students as much as we want them to do the work to keep in touch with us. Uh, and, and then maybe they will come back or they'll remember us. So great point, Jerry, I love it. Thank you. So if we remember them, they might remember us. That's Is the that idea, it? that's okay. the idea. Great, thank you. What are some other questions that uh, you might have before we move into how to put your cases together? All right, looks like you're ready to move on, and so am I. We'll have time at the end to ask any more questions about the things that are uh, that have come up now or that uh, still remain for you. So let's talk about your case statement. This is a piece of paper. It's also a virtual document. Everything that I'm saying today, uh, I want us to think about having a paper version for those who need it and an electronic version uh, for those who would rather have it so that it can be emailed, it can be put on a website, it can also have a stamp put on it and sent out. Uh, it can be left at the back of the church for people to pick up. Have everything uh, duplicated. It doesn't take any, any difference to make it uh, a PDF as it does to have it as a printed document. So make sure you're doing all of these things in duplicate. Your case should tell your history, your story. It should talk about your impact and your mission. So inward and outward. I want us to remember that sometimes our churches say, well, we don't have a food pantry or a clothing drive or whatever, but we have a lot of internal ministry. We have pastoral care. We have Sunday school. We have Christian education. We have groups that meet. Talk about those. Uh, there's impact happening, whether it's external or internal. Talk about the services you offer. So that's, your, yes, your services in a big capital S, uh, the things that you do on Sundays and weekdays to bring people together to worship, but also the services that you offer the community. So are there 12-step um, groups that are meeting there? Are there Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops that meet there? Are there preschools that uh, are a part of it? Are you doing that sort of work? Uh, let people know that you're more than just a church. You're also a community place where people come uh, to get services. Always tell the story and ask and provide ways that your members can help through their time, 
their talent and their treasure. Give them the options and tell them all the ways that they can connect. And then tell your story of how your congregation is changing the world. Uh, tell that story and be proud of that story because whatever you're doing in your community is impacting the people who live there positively. Tell that story. You should have some organizational history. And we're gonna go into details on these, on these in a minute. We should have some organizational history. Talk about who you serve, uh, how you came to be. Talk about the needs and challenges as well. So we tend to only want to put positive information in our case for giving, uh, and, and, and that's important because uh, we want to show the best foot forward. But we can also talk about uh, places of growth or things that we need to change or struggles that our community are having. Uh, you might talk about um, how your community has changed. Maybe an industry has left and there's higher unemployment, or maybe there's um, maybe there are addiction and recovery problems, not, not within your church, but in your greater community. Maybe you want to name those and address them. Uh, maybe there have been some other kinds of problems or changes and challenges that you want to talk about and how your church is there to provide support and services to your community. We want to give them evidence of good stewardship, and we'll talk about all these in a second. Uh, we want to be transparent and accountable, show them how our money is spent, how it's collected, where it's going, and the impact. And then we want to show people and give people ways to support. The more, the better. And we'll talk about this in a second. So let's talk about your history, your organizational history. These questions that I'm suggesting are ones that you can go through in your case-making process. Maybe you interview uh, some of your longest members or dig through the archives or look at the book of register, the registry and see what kinds of people and services have happened in your community. Uh, my own church, uh, which is Holy Innocence Church in San Francisco, is right around the corner from the hospital that used to be the Episcopal Hospital, St. Luke's. It's just about um, three blocks away. And um, I was looking through the parish register uh, and in 1917 and 1918, when the Spanish flu was in San Francisco, um, there are pages and pages and pages of funerals listed just like three a day uh, for a number of months. And it's really empower it's really powerful to see what this little church did in a time because it was close to this uh, hospital where people were dying. And it gives a window into what this church was at that moment, right? So when we look through the parish registry, when we look through the archives, we get real glimpses of who we are and how we've been there. Look at the names on your stained glass windows. Uh, who are the founding members? Who are the members that started your church? Were they part of the civic structure at the time? Um, who is your patron? Your patron saint or your patron feast? Uh, why, was that, um, why was that picked? Is it the date that was closest to the founding of your church? Or does it have some special meaning for the people who founded it? You can start to get at these questions, right? Gives you color and things to put into your case that talks about who you are and who you have been. Uh, talk about your neighborhood and how it's changed throughout the years. You know, it used to be a working class neighborhood and then um, it had some sort of economic change after the war. And then this kind of a community moved into it. And now we have these sorts of businesses and families that live here, right? So tell the story of your community and how it's changed and how your church has been there through it and changed and talked about and served your community throughout all these changes. Uh, talk about any famous people locally or, or more renowned who have been a member or affiliated. So this is about your civic leaders. This is about people who have founded companies or nonprofits. 
um, maybe been a part of arts organizations in your community. Talk about that. Uh, talk about uh, people who were raised up in ministry and are now priests or bishops uh, in the church and talk about how you've contributed to the whole church through the ministries that were started in your own congregation. Why do you put this in your case statement? And why do you tell the story? Because it talks about who you have been and, and then we'll get to part B, which is who you want to be and where you're focusing. Talk about your neighbors. What's the character of your community? Characterize it. We are uh, an up and coming neighborhood that is uh, rebuilding after economic upheaval in our in our community. Uh, we are a neighborhood of, you know, whatever. Talk about that. Characterize it. Walk around your neighborhood. Get acquainted. Ask people who we are. What are the people and who are the people that are served by your outward ministries? So if, if, if it's a food program or a tutoring program, where are they coming from? Why do they need your support? Uh, how did you identify that particular need and begin to fill it? Um, you know, and, and look at that. We had an interesting thing in San Francisco a few years ago where a lot of churches read um, Sarah Miles' incredible book, uh, Take This Bread, which is about starting a food ministry program in your church. And there was a little money attached to it, right? If you wanted to do it, there was a foundation that would give you some seed money. And we had like seven Episcopal churches, three of them within walking distance that all started food ministries. Great, okay, it was, but it was maybe too many. We had too many food ministries and too small of a place. And so we had to start looking at ways to combine them. So sometimes we start ministries and then we need to change them. Uh, take a look at that. Have you changed um, as your neighborhoods have changed? or as the need has changed in your community? Who's served by your inward focus ministries? Do you have a special charism for taking care of seniors? Are you well situated close to a university where you have college students that visit you and so maybe you tend them in a way? Do you have a big uh, active Sunday school program or a youth program or are you about families or are you about you know, wh whatever you are, uh, talk about who you are serving inward and outward. Finally, do you have other groups that use your space, like 12 step groups or employment um, help agencies, nonprofits, uh, support for um, people who are doing uh, caregiving work in the community? Do you have uh, disaster preparedness? group that meets in your church, for example? Uh, are you a community organizing? Uh, those sorts of things. They help us understand what our church is doing. And we should talk about those things because it's evidence that our church is embedded and responsive to our neighborhoods. What do your neighbors need from you? So having identified who they are, how can you serve them? One of the things I love to do with churches is to get them to walk around their communities. Um, and this is an intergenerational activity, right? Some people can walk further and faster than others, and that's great, and send them out. See who, who's in, the, in your neighborhood. Uh, see what nonprofits are there. See what nonprofits and services aren't there that you might be able to provide. Uh, again, a story from my own church. We did this exercise about two decades ago and realized that the streets near us were literally clogged with people with strollers uh, pushing their kids and families were moving in and they weren't at our church. And so we intentionally changed up our program and started advertising to them and brought them in. And now we have this amazing family ministry. It took a while to build it and there was a lot of work that needed, but we discovered it because we were literally walking the parish boundaries and had groups that were complaining about getting stuck behind strollers. And we're like, we should pay attention to that. Do this work. It's really beautiful work in your church and it can lead to all kinds of activities. 
So also you might sponsor or send people on mission trips and other things. That's also your neighborhood. Those groups and the work that you're doing to support ministries like that are really important. Talk about them in your case. We need to put in our case that we have some evidence of good stewardship. Transparent and accountable leadership is absolutely essential in our churches. So let people know that the budget is accessible. It's on a bulletin board, it's on a website, uh, we mail it out once a year, whatever you do, let people know it's on the back of the annual report at your annual meeting. Let people know where they can find the budget. And, um, and that's important because we need to show them that the church counts their money, spends their money, cares for their money. It helps people understand that they can trust the church with their gifts. Make your fundraising goals clear. This is uh, about Phoebe's question earlier. Uh, is it for a special campaign? Is it for the operating fund? Are you, is this an endowment that uh, you're asking for? Is it a capital gift? The clearer you are and the more precise, the more people will be able to understand what the focus is and where they can help and how they can help. Um, do you publish your vestry minutes? Are your minutes, are your meetings open? I don't know how many people who aren't on the vestry would want to go to a vestry meeting, but do they know that they have the opportunity and the option of dropping in or telling or asking to be uh, invited? Um, this is a really important thing if that kind of openness is a part of your bylaws or a part of your community. And when there are things that have gone wrong, either in our community or in our congregation, Maybe we had uh, a, a bad year or came close to closing, or we had to make some shifts in our budget or our ministry because of our, our fundraising. Or if we're in a period of economic challenge in the community, perhaps an industry is closed or perhaps other things have happened, name it, talk about it, give it a timeline and talk about what you're doing to ameliorate or alleviate, uh, to, to change that. Um, when we hide something or don't talk about something, it becomes that elephant in the room and we can all see it anyway. So when we name something, then we can begin to talk about how we address it. Your leadership is forward thinking. So think about, this is that aspirational piece of your case. Uh, what, are you, what are your goals for the future? What are you hoping to do? What ministries would you like to create? If you had an unlimited budget, where would you start your next ministry and what would you do? Uh, talk about um, your aspirations for the future. Do you have building or staffing goals? Maybe you wanna hire a new position or, or give training to a new team or expand someone from part-time to full-time. So if you're asking for that kind of growth in this year's fundraising, so we're hoping to increase our youth person from 50% to 100% um, salary, um, then we're asking everybody to increase their giving by this much or proportionally or to help out with this. Be clear. If you have a goal, state it. Help people get there. When they know what they're working for, they can help you achieve it. And also, if there are predictable future events, like you know an industry is going to cut back jobs or the local food bank is going to be cutting back and so your church is gonna to have to step up donations or something like that, start to address it, put a plan around it, put it in your case for giving. We're gonna be faced with this soon. Let's start to plan for it now. Please make sure that you, on your case for support, tell people how they can make a gift. Um, I've seen the most beautiful brochures and websites that forget to say, here's where you can send a check. Here's how you can make a gift online. Here's the form that you fill out. Whatever you want them to do, make sure you give them instructions on how to do it. Um, if you're doing text giving, online giving, um, if you want them to fill out a pledge card, uh, make sure you tick all the boxes to, if they wanna give through stocks or through their other appreciated assets, through their retirement accounts, 
if they want to make a bank check, help them understand it. You can't provide too much information on how people can make a gift to you because you never know who won't make a gift because their option isn't available. We did a lot of work on, there's a webinar you can look at on our website if you missed it already on uh, Virtual Stewardship 201. Just go to our website and, and take a look at it. What it will help you see is that um, when we ask for money in all the different ways that we need to, we can then uh, ensure that our giving is donor centric. For years, the Episcopal Church has said, we love your cash in a plate. We love your checks in an envelope. Here's how you can give to us. Uh, but what we need to do more and more is focus on how the donor wants to engage with us and how to make it easy for them. So the more information we can provide, um, the better. Okay, so now you've got all this information together and you need to put it together in something that is really concise. So do all that writing and edit it and slash it and red pen it and make it concise. Use um, points uh, instead of long sentences. Help people understand how they can have an impact and where their giving can come in. Make your ask as specific as possible. The general rule uh, that I use in fundraising is a general ask yields a general result. The more clear you are with how much you're asking for, where it's going, why, and what the timeline is, the better people can respond to it. If you have a other goal like increasing volunteers or needing to fill committees or doing that work, be clear about that and state it as well. Finally, don't forget to test your draft. Test it on a small sample audience before you send it off to print or before you start to send it out for your campaign. Here's a little next level challenge for you. If you can get your case to fit on the front and back of a three by five card, this is an actual size three by five card. If you can get your case to fit on a three by five card, you are doing a great job at communicating to the world what you're doing and what you're asking money for. So this particular sample church uh, is doing great work. They have a picture of themselves. They have all the ways that you can make a gift to them uh, on their form with links. Um, and, and it tells you very quickly what this church's impact is in the community. It has a nice picture of people enjoying what that church is offering. This is just a little challenge for you. If you can get it on the front and back of a three by five card, you know you have a really well-crafted case statement. Okay, it's fine if you go onto an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, maybe you can even fold it and make it pretty. You can do those kinds of brochures and impact statements as well. But this is just a little example of how the simplest case statement can also be effective. It doesn't have to be long to be effective. What makes for a good case? Pictures are really important. Pictures tell stories that words might take a long time to do. So have a good picture uh, and have multiple pictures uh, to talk about your different program areas, if that's what you're doing. Uh, make sure you get uh, permission if you're using pictures from your own church. And absolutely, if you're gonna post it on your website, if there are children involved, make sure that you have the appropriate permissions from their parents to do so. Um, have the pictures be good and have the pictures show life and people smiling. Um, one of the things that we do often and I've done it myself in, in things. We show Episcopalians singing with like their, the hymnal or their uh, service leaflet in front of them. Nobody looks good with their mouth open and with a piece of paper in front of them. Uh, it might be vital, it might be vibrant, it might've been a great time, but it doesn't make for a good picture. The other picture we love to take 
is the back of people's heads all paying attention to something that's happening up front. Uh, and we show that as a good time. It maybe was a good time, but um, nothing about the back of people's heads says, come in, we're welcoming, we're excited about this. So make sure when you're taking pictures uh, and that they're your pictures, that you're getting people full on, that they're engaged um, and that you're showing what they're doing. Minimize your copy, use tight sentences with action oriented words. Again, this is why you draft it, you revise it, you test it, you refine it, uh, make your case as clear as possible. And then use numbers whenever you can to talk about the work that you're doing. We're feeding 100 people this year, we're serving this many meals, we have this many backpacks that we've built, we have we, you know, we, whatever it is, however you want to quantify your work and your ministry, talk about that. We have five groups that meet that do book studies together and Bible studies. Our, you know, our people get together every Friday night to, to talk, uh, to come to church and play games and have a social night. Those are things that people like to see. Be specific and use numbers about that. Storytelling is really important. Testimonials are important in your fundraising. If you can include it in your brochure, great. If you bring it in during the campaign, like from the chancel steps or make a video that you put on your website or your um, Facebook page, telling the story of why people support you, what they get out of it. Uh, if, you, if you have outward facing ministries and it's appropriate, for your clients to talk about uh, what they what they get from you and why it matters to them, uh, share those stories and videos and messages as well. These are really impactful testimonials that help people feel uh, engaged with the work that we're doing. Always begin, continue, and finish with gratitude and examples of generosity. Everything that we're doing in this is because we are grateful for what we have received and we are open to expressing and experiencing that joy through our generosity with others. So gratitude and generosity should weave through our work together as we thank people. Uh, you should market your case. Um, as I said before, if you have a paper version, also have a PDF that you can mail, uh, put it on your website, put it in your newsletter, put it on your social media sites, put it in your e-newsletter, e uh, put these things out there so that people can respond to them. And challenge everyone to develop their own speaking points about what they've read in the case. So, Somebody, if they, if they meet me and say, what, 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 tell me about your church, I should have a couple of things that I want to say to them about what we do and what it means to me. And it should be quick. That elevator speech, um, that metaphor of having 11 seconds in an elevator with someone to tell them everything you need to tell them about your, your uh, ministry or your idea. Use that, use that method. I only have a, a couple of seconds here to get my point across. What are your talking points about what your church does? Uh, finally, um, you might include other stewardship documents in your final presentation. Uh, you can put these on your website or they can be attached to the other materials that you create. A line item budget is something that's really important. So show them last year's budget with a year to date or an actual, you know, show them that you said you were gonna raise and spend this much money. This is how much money you raised and spent. This is what you're hoping to raise and spend next year. Um, and even if you make your budget after your pledge campaign, give them some estimates, you know, this is what we did this year and this is what we hope to do next year. Uh, we need your gift to fill in uh, the specifics. Um, 
remember that line item budgets don't tell the whole story. Um, they just talk about the money in and the money out. So you might rely on a narrative budget. TENS has some great examples on its website of how to create a narrative budget and what, uh, what a narrative budget can do for you. This narrative budget takes your fixed costs, salaries, utilities, building and maintenance, insurance, and spreads them over your ministry areas so that people can say, well, what does it cost us to do worship? What does it cost us to have youth ministry? What does it cost us? And what, what can I do? How does my gift impact this? It's really helpful. A narrative budget can help tell the story. Um, make sure you include pledge cards. The TENS resources this year have a great pledge card example. And we have um, Charles Cluen on today's call who will remind us all to ask for planned giving, uh, to ask people if they've made a bequest, put that information on your pledge cards as well so that people can be thinking. It takes seven times at least for people to be asked to make a planned gift before they say yes. So give them those opportunities as often as you can to show them all the ways that they can make gifts now and later to your congregation. Um, your narrative budget, um, by describing your budget in terms of your ministry priorities, it helps you explain uh, how you raise and spend your money. So use this document. Um, TENS has a great example of how to turn your Excel spreadsheet line item budget into a narrative budget. Uh, it'll help you in how you present your case. The theme for this year in TENS is every perfect gift. And we want you to go out there this year in your fundraising efforts and ask for and expect every perfect gift for your campaign this year. It comes from James 117, every generous act and every perfect gift comes from God above. And we want people to remember what we're doing and why we're doing it. We've got a few minutes left. I know I pushed through a lot of information there at the end. I want to make sure that I get your questions answered in the time that we have left. I see a couple of things um, here that have come in from the uh, from chat. And Tom asks when the slides will be available uh, later this afternoon. It takes me usually about an hour or so to upload the video to YouTube and then post it on our website. And so I will send you all an email this afternoon letting you know that it's up and ready to go. Thanks, Tom, for your question. If you've got another question, please raise your hand uh, and come off mute and I am here to answer it. We've covered a lot today. Any questions about um, crafting your case statement, why you would do things, uh, why would you, you would put uh, certain things in your case statement or how to test it, any experiences with any of that you'd like to share? Mary, I see you've got a question. You wanna come off mute? I just wondered if you could say a little bit more what you mean by testing the case. I understood you said not your vestry, but <laughs> if you could just say a little bit of how that would work. Yeah, sure. Well, you can think about it um, like a focus group where you bring people together and show them a draft of your case statement and ask them for feedback. You know, does this reflect what our congregation, what you think our congregation does? Are we asking for money in the right way? Does it appeal to you? Uh, how would you change it? These are questions we can ask in a testing phase. And I suggest that we get people who are uh, of different kinds of experiences, ages, longevity of membership, so that you get a real understanding of how your case uh, is received by different members of your community. This helps you then refine it. If you're saying, you're spending too much time on your organizational history and everybody knows it, 
ask them that, you know, do we not need to include so much here? Maybe we can focus more on this. So testing it is really good. Thank you for your question. Yes, I see your question, Ms. Duke. Hi, um, Mary from St. Peter's in Clarksboro, New Jersey. Um, do you typically include the case statement in um, the packet of information that we send out to everyone for stewardship season? We've not done that in the past. I, I, like, a, I like it. I like a brochure or a case statement. Um, to, to go out with all the other materials. Uh, sometimes it can take the form of, of a narrative budget and that can be sufficient. Um, the case statement helps people understand why you're asking for money and tells a little bit of the story in a way the letter or the other information might not. Again, this is all about how much, how much time do you have? how many people are working on your committee. Not every church can create a huge case statement, which is why I say you can do something really simple like the front and back of a three by five mm -hmm. card mm -hmm. and communicate it as well. It's just another visual way to share the information. Great question, Mary. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Phoebe. Yeah, uh, could you comment on the effects of COVID and fundraising in this era, which is right on COVID? Yeah, great question. Present of mind for everyone on this call and all around the country, I'm sure. Um, so what we saw last year uh, in terms of, of pledge and COVID is that many of our congregations, not all, many of our congregations did just fine between PPP loans and people continuing to being able to pay their pledges. Uh, most congregations continue to raise money as expected, especially when they adopted methods for people to be able to make their gift online. Although people were still writing and sending checks and churches were still cashing them. So that happened. I think what has happened in COVID, it's more about how we communicate and how we tell people what we're like, get them involved in different ways. When we haven't been able to gather in person and do some of the work that we're used to being able to do week by week, we have to put that storytelling, that impact that we want people to know about our ministries into different ways. And that's why I suggest doing some case statement work or using all of the social media that's available to you or having a, a phone tree that tells the story, having your website have all of this information on it. Uh, that is one of the things that's come out of COVID is we need to find more ways to connect and tell the story. I think we can expect with recovery starting in a lot of places that this year's stewardship campaigns will be robust. Uh, and that will also differ from community to community. Some communities, as we know, are, are still deep in restriction or facing them again, and that's going to impact the way people can gather. And so I think we're going to have to keep our virtual stewardship campaigns alive again this year. Make certain that we're using Zoom, social media, to stay in touch with each other and have electronic giving information out, gifts coming in, uh, keep that alive uh, in this next stewardship round. So I think we're not all back yet. Thanks, Phoebe. And are the people, the people that attend our services online from places in Europe, are they potential pledgers? Heck yeah. Everyone who attends your church is a potential pledger. <laughs> and if you, um, you know, you can put a link and if you're using Zoom, if you're putting Facebook Live, you can put a link to your stewardship page and say, mm -hmm. we're doing fundraising now. This is our church's ministry. You're a part of it. We're here being able to video to you in Europe um, because of your gifts. So absolutely, if they're tuning in, they are, they are potential donors. Ask them. Okay. Just ask Thank them. You. you can never go wrong by asking. Okay, that's right. Hello. Thank you. 
Hi, Reese. Hi, it's uh, Richard Reese, Wilmington, Delaware. So relating to the generations, I've always wanted to reach out to various seminaries since most of the uh, seminarians are in their 20s and 30s. And as a survey question like, how should the churches be approaching their generations? And what are their questions about spirituality and why are they turned off by churches? And what would be good outreach of approaches to reach the other generations, the X's and all those behind the baby boomers. I'm in the, just behind the baby boomers. Yeah. But that to me was seen to be helpful for churches to reach out to seminaries and ask, ask for that kind of a survey question to reach out to those generations. That's a great idea. And your, your local seminaries or any seminary may have some good evidence of that. I got most of my statistics uh, and there's much more out there um, from the Lake Institute of Faith and Giving. Uh, they are a institute out of the Indiana University Lilly School of Philanthropy. Um, and it's a great organization. The Lake Institute has just, they, they have this 2019 study, which was comprehensive. Uh, and they have a new, smaller version of it that's post COVID that really talks about generational differences, motivations in giving, uh, and starts to also address the cultural divide in, um, in how different ethnic congregations look at fundraising culturally. And so uh, I commend the Lake Institute for you. A Google search will turn it up and it, they provide those resources for free and the Lilly School of Philanthropy knows its stuff and it's really good. And they're Episcopalian funded, so even better. Any more questions? Uh, hi, Richard. Hi, I didn't have a question, but I had a comment. We took advantage of our virtual coffee hours last year on Zoom and had picked a Sunday to do a presentation where we broke up in small groups after um, comments from our rector uh, talking about stewardship. And we paired a member of the stewardship committee with a vestry member in the different groups. And our, our main ask was, are you willing to commit to a pledge? We didn't care how much, but we wanted to encourage people to make that commitment. And I think that worked very well for us. Although when we're uh, back into our actual in-person coffee hour. I'm not sure how well that's going to interpret into live live presence, but uh, that seemed to work for us during the, the COVID restrictions. Yeah, Richard, thank you. And certainly um, many of our community tens recommended that model last year and many other communities were doing that model of small group work. Uh, often our congregations do it in small groups anyway, uh, maybe a dinner church or a small group meeting. Uh, and I think that your, low, your coffee hour is a great place to initiate that conversation and then maybe set up those small groups. So, you know, Davey will be hosting a group at his house on Tuesday night, or, you know, we'll have another group here on Monday morning that will be talking about this, whatever, uh, how the ways you can do that. I think small groups are always good ways to foster the, the, that kind of community where people can become vulnerable and talk about their faith journey and their stewardship journey and why they give. I, I love that you did it. And I think, well, there are some things that we learned in the pandemic, especially around Zoom, that um, we might stick with. Many of us are ready to get off Zoom for a while, but from time to time, the, the ways that we can now open up our living rooms without being in our living rooms uh, can help us uh, stay connected. So you might find ways this year to continue doing some small group work on Zoom. Great, thanks. Thank you. I know we are over our time um, and your questions have been great. I really appreciate you doing this work and engaging with us uh, on it. I want to say, and I say this in every webinar, Fundraising is, is important work and it's not easy work. I recognize that, um, that you are being called to do something that is really powerful and hard 
and I appreciate that you are doing it in your congregations. Your congregations appreciate it as well. And so thank you from TENS for the work that you're doing. I really appreciate it. It is God's work and uh, we need this with you. So in conclusion, I wanted to remind you all that I will send out slides and the video uh, and some other links of what we've talked about today uh, that'll all be posted on the TENS website by the end of the day. And I'll send you an email later when it's up. And I appreciate you all for being here today and being a part of this. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day and get back to your Saturdays. It's a beautiful day here in San Francisco. I hope it's there too. See Thank you later. You. Goodbye, friends.